Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Rubin and I'm the Vice President of Partnerships and Special Projects for the American Society of the University of Haifa. It is both disheartening and critical that we gather in this day to confront anti-Semitism as a global pandemic and consider how to best fight against it. We are extremely lucky to, to be joined today by two people who have dedicated their academic and professional lives to education, advocacy, and activism on behalf of Israel and Jewish people around the world. Dr. Sharon Nazarian is a longtime leader, friend, and supporter of ASUH and University of Haifa. She is the Senior Vice President in International Affairs for the Anti-Defamation League, founder of the Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and sits on the board of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Dr. Nazarian is a member of the University of Haifa Board of Governors and also serves as the Vice Chair of the Board of the American Society of the University of Haifa. Jordana Gessler is a Distinguished University of Haifa alumna. She is Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust and serves as the 3G at LA Moth Executive Board, a group of grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who are passionate about stewarding legacy and engaging the future. Uh, Ms. Gessler, Ms. Gessler competed a year long internship at Yad Vashem and is a member of the prestigious Rautenberg New Leaders Project 2020. I thank you both very much for being with us today and uh, Jordana and Sharon, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharon, before we jump into your work at the ADL, in addition to your leadership role with the University of Haifa, you are an activist, an academic, and a philanthropist. Can you discuss what has shaped your path the most as a fighter against anti-Semitism and champion for racial justice? And also, is there any way that your role or the role of your heritage as a Persian Jew played in your path? Thank you, Jordana. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you here and uh, anything to, that I can do to help the Friends of American Society of Haifa University is indeed a pleasure for me to do. Um, my background definitely influenced my path in life. Um, so as you can imagine, as, a, as an immigrant who had to leave my country of birth, of Iran, because of the 1979 revolution, coming via Israel to the US, to Los Angeles, and really establishing myself uh, in this new homeland. Um, really, I was informed not only by my education, you know, once I got my doctorate degree in political science and I started teaching, more than anything, um, the sense of, I think, what many immigrants feel, which is a sense of how quickly home can be lost and what it is to set new roots and new, um, create a new home. So a lot of my work, which was really in three, three buckets, basically my life was academia, it was foreign policy and philanthropy came together um, in this position that now I've been holding at ADL for the last three years um, in advocating, educating and teaching about anti-Semitism globally. So the path that brought me here uh, was one that really informed me about the importance of what happens when extremism and extremist ideology take over a country as it did in Iran and continues to do today. Iran is still the number one state sponsor of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial in the world. So unfortunately, my country of birth continues to follow me and my work very closely. Um, when we look at in terms of um, foreign policy, the, the way that my life was impacted by the fact-finding missions that I participated in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in North Korea, in Cuba, really understanding um, where does the role of the US come in and where do we as a main uh, leader in the democratic world, um, what kind of a role model um, and responsibility do we have vis-a-vis -vis other nations? Um, that really impacted me a lot. And I understood that now as an American, we have tools um, and assets at our disposal that can be helpful and then philanthropy was very important as well. Philanthropy is a way of changing society without having to rely on government. Government can do so much, but I really believe in civil society. I believe very wholeheartedly 
that non, um, uh, non governmental organizations and civil society have such a tremendous role to play when it comes to fighting um, extremism, fighting hate, fighting anti Semitism, and keeping our societies as healthy as possible. And sadly, right now, we have a lot of examples where many countries are going in the wrong direction. And so my coming to ADL really brought together all my three worlds that I had been very active in um, as an Iranian American. And also I have to say that coming to a hundred year old organization, a major American Jewish organization that was led for most of its time by Ashkenazi men, um, it was also important for me. It was important that the executive leadership of ADL also had reflected the diversity of American Jewry today. Um, that we are Ashkenazim and we're Sephardim and we're Mizrahim and we're women and we're men and we're, um, all, all, you know, whatever we self -identify, identify as has to also be reflected and as the leadership of ADL if we are truly going to be reflective of the societies we hope to serve. I think that's a really good point and especially drawing from your background and also your research in looking at societies and communities of Jews throughout the globe. Um, what is your take just coming from your specific perspective when you see the ADL's latest annual audit of anti-Semitism and it's showing that there's a record high number of anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S., for example? I mean, how, what does that trend look like to you from your position, um, especially compared to uh, the rise of anti-Semitism elsewhere in the globe? Well, again, I have to tell you that as a professional, I have one reaction, but as personally, I also had a very um, uh, emotional reaction to those um, um, data points. 2019 especially was a very, very difficult year for American Jewry. We had the incident at Poway in San Diego uh, in the synagogue there. We had Jersey City. We had Monsi. We had in Brooklyn where Jews who looked Jewish, visibly Jewish, were being attacked day after day after day. So as someone who fled a country because of safety issues and because my family felt unsafe, coming to a haven where we felt we would be safe and secure personally, it was very, um, I would say, frightening to see the trends in America and how American Jews who have been the, you know, the community around the world that were the safest in this position that I've had before, um, right at the beginning of my position, I would go around and visit communities in, in South Africa, in, in um, Brazil, in Belgium, and I would say, we, the safe American Jews, are here to help you. I wouldn't say those words, but that was a little bit implicit in what I had to say. And I know that today, I cannot say that anymore. So in fact, it's been in some ways a um, fear, fear, um, fearful uh, reaction, but also a humbling reaction, that we as American Jews cannot take our safety for granted, that we cannot feel that we're beyond um, the reach of some of these threats that are also threatening our communities in America today. We cannot be complacent. And therefore, um, my Iranian head, in a way, helps understand what is going on in America as through the eyes of an immigrant and what we could lose. So that's very front and center for me. What is at stake here? And that we cannot take our eyes off of that or take it for granted. Yeah, that definitely resonates deeply with me um, as a child of immigrants and the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, just seeing these frightening changes taking place um, as unfortunate trends in society. And especially, I think, mostly impacted in the last year, even by COVID-19. And um, I know that ADL had already been in, um, demonstrating that there's been a rise of anti-Semitism, but how do you think COVID-19 has fueled anti-Semitism worldwide? Uh, I'm mean, sure this isn't a surprise for you and definitely isn't a surprise for anyone who's studied Jewish history or Holocaust history, considering the fact that anti-Semitic conspiracy theories involving disease um, has been around for, for centuries. But what do you think we can do to counter anti-Semitic falsehoods and slanders like this that, that are linking COVID-19 and the pandemic with anti-Semitism? One of the first things we did when we all started working from home was really reach out to almost every single Jewish community around the world. So my team, the way we function, um, we really divide the world by regions. We do not have offices around the world. The only office that ADL has outside the U.S. is in Jerusalem. And I do have a small team in Berlin, so we will be expanding our work in Europe. 
But as I did these consultations with Jewish communities around the world to see how they're faring and how are they dealing with not only loss of Jewish life and not being able to go to synagogue and going to the mikveh and doing all the usual rituals, but also how they're being impacted by economic issues, by access to food, access to healthcare. You know, Europe, especially Italy at the beginning was really burning and was in very difficult situation. One of the very common themes that we saw and we were reported to by the communities around the world was not only the moment at that moment when things were so bad, but also the economic anxieties that they will be, they were expecting to happen as the world went into some sort of an economic um, repression or economic slowdown, the high rise of unemployment. And I think Jewish communities around the world know not only the, the fact of the pandemic itself, but the economic outcome of a major slowdown and the, the ripple effects of that in society, what that rises to, and usually the front and center of that is anti-Semitism. So many of the Jewish communities around the world were talking about the day after, about what happens when their economy, the country's uh, economies go into a slump, there's huge unemployment, and what does the scapegoating that take, will take place, that they were afraid will take place as a result of the fears and anxiety of the population. So COVID has not only impacted Jewish communities in every way that every other citizen has been impacted. I think we're all citizens of our countries and we have to deal with the ramifications of this pandemic. But on top of it, we also feel as a vulnerable community, as a vulnerable minority, that the rise of conspiracy theories, the rise, especially in non-democratic governments where governments use um, um, scapegoating of minorities, especially Jews, to blame and to deflect from their own failures. So governments that are not able to provide for their, um, for their citizens really tend to use conspiracy theories as a mechanism of deflecting. And we see that um, on, in Iran, we see it in, in um, many, many uh, Latin American countries, we see it in Europe as well. So the, that's really where communities come together and are, have this shared concern and worry about what will this bring for us? And are we going to have this repeat of historic tropes and historic scapegoating of Jews in times of crisis? And this is definitely a time of crisis, just like all the historical ones we've, we've studied. Yeah, so you're addressing um, greatly the historical patterns that we see where there is a moment where communities or governments will scapegoat a, a minority group, oftentimes Jews in this case, what we're talking about, the, the rise of anti-Semitism, but also extremist organizations, which I know is part of your background in studying extremist um, extremism will target them as well. What would you say are some of the most effective ways that larger institutions can combat anti-Semitism, um, not just on the individual level, but really looking towards either corporations or nonprofits who, who have a platform? What, do you, what ways do you see that they can educate um, against anti-Semitism? I, I want to bring attention to a campaign that ADL launched uh, just under a month ago, which is called Stop Hate for Profit. This is really looking at the, the, just the ample access to extremist ideology on social media platforms. We all know that the social media has become um, a real um, amplifier of speech and a lot of hate speech as well. So in one of our very core missions of ADL, which is to um, battle and combat um, hate speech online, we launched um, a campaign really after building on about five year um, period of engaging with the major social media platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, like Reddit, with all of them, we've had meetings about their terms of use um, uh, regulations, we've had meetings about engineering, um, uh, solutions to battling online hate. And we reached a point where we really felt that they were not meeting their responsibilities. And Facebook as a larger, and we're on it right now, um, as the largest purveyor of, of social media, um, we targeted um, uh, Facebook to bring pressure on them by launching this campaign called Stop Hate for Profit. Um, and it's really encouraging large corporations who buy ad, so paid advertising in, in Facebook, to take a pause for the month of July. And so right now we're in the middle of the campaign. It has been hugely success, successful. We've had over 1,000 international brands 
that have come on board, brands that all household names that you would know. And, um, and we did this in partnership with major civil rights organizations, NAACP, Color of Change, and others, who understood that at this moment in our country, in the US, this is a time to bear pressure on social media companies to take responsibility for what they can do to really make sure that we're addressing the level of um, hate online. What we're seeing is, and all the examples I gave from the atrocities of 2019 in, in, uh, in Poway, in, other, in, in, in um, Charlottesville, we see the radicalization of um, uh, people online in ways that are just unprecedented before and the normalization of this kind of extremist ideology. So unless um, large companies like Facebook um, come to terms with the fact that they have a role to play here and they have to be part of the solution, as well as on the legislative side, you know, we are a civil rights organization that have been you know, fighting for the First Amendment from the beginning, but we do feel that this is a moment of reckoning where um, these privately held companies have a responsibility just like any other sector, like the automobile industry and others for safety of their, of their customers. So this is one area where ADL will be leaning in and we're gonna be doing um, as much as possible to bear pressure on social media companies to do what they, they can, whether it's through all artificial intelligence and machine learning or whatever mechanisms at their disposal to make sure that hate is not just so readily available as it is today. It is really tremendous that our youth, our teenagers um, just can get on a gaming site even. And as they're playing with others, um, we know this, we have, we have documented that um, white supremacist uh, recruiters come on gaming sites knowing that that is a place where they can um, recruit disaffected, maybe unhappy young um, uh, uh, teenagers who are looking for a place of belonging. So these platforms have to be regulated in a way that keeps the, uh, the user safe and ADL will be doing whatever we can in this specific battle. There are many battles that we're fighting, but this is a very big one that we're gonna lean into. I think that's, I mean, the importance of free speech is paramount in our society, in our country, but there's always a very important understanding of the difference between free speech and hate speech and sort of how hate rhetoric can really shape a population or shape a community and instigate violence. Um, so I, I do want to stay on this, this thread of social media. I have another question for you, but I also want to remind people who are watching and tuning in today to please share your own questions. We'll be taking some uh, questions from the audience. So if you think of something, just jot it in that chat in that Q&A section and we will definitely read your questions. Uh, going back to what you were saying about social media, and I know that the ADL has led this incredible campaign um, for the month of July and a few different organizations and companies that I'm affiliated with have joined you in, in not promoting and not um, paying for advertising on, on Facebook as a platform. But I do want to discuss something that's a little bit newer than that and more recent, which is a study that just came out from the University of Haifa, where researchers there found that TikTok users are targeting young people with anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. And so as you're saying, with the gaming industry, there is this moment of targeting youth um, but TikTok is a very new platform and, you know, this is not a new phenomenon, but I think there's this changing way that, um, that, you know, people are maybe not, are overlooking TikTok in this way. And I'm wondering, you know, what do you think is new and significant about the study's finding and how does it play into things that you've already discussed and, and that you know of with regard to social media? Well, again, I'm, I'm not a, a, you know, software engineer, so I don't know exactly if there's anything different with TikTok, of course, algorithms that are used by social media uh, companies basically give you what you like. So whatever the content that you're engaging with, they will keep offering you more of that. And TikTok, just like others, but it, it, TikTok, I think, got attention because it was overlooked until then. And really, this report is the one that brought really shed light attention on this exploding, exploding um, site. And also more sensitively, TikTok targets very young people. Um, we can tell the generational divide between you know, who's a TikTok user and who's not. And so the fact that um, TikTok is so readily available to a very, very young cohort and young uh, generation, um, and that access to this kind of um, hate language and specifically anti-Semitic language 
is so readily available and, and the algorithms continue to purvey you and continue to pr provide you with more of it just because the way the software engineering is done. So I'm glad that the attention has been brought onto TikTok as well. We cannot ignore any platform, but especially the fact that it's so youth oriented really worried us and we're glad that there's more attention on it now. Now, whether TikTok will do anything about it, again, we'll have to bear pressure and make sure um, it's a different animal, I have to say. you know, uh, It's one thing dealing with American uh, based social media companies TikTok is, is something else and we'll have to figure out how do we deal with that. But I think it's really the responsibility of parents, especially to know um, as, as much as we can, um, what are our children watching, what are they experiencing, and also to explain to our children how those algorithms work. So even if you're not seeking it out, um, it will come to you. So we have to be extra vigilant. And so it takes you know, both sides of it, you're putting pressure on the platforms, but also education is becomes very, very important. Yeah, and um, I think that your point that it's about our understanding of how the algorithms respond to the things that we're searching and looking at is very important because this is an opportunity for all of us to take action. It's not just about boycotting a social media company or being in a, a position of government or influence to influence uh, the social media companies, but truly we can all do our part in discussing the ways that anti-Semitism and hatred on these platforms are disseminated. And I know that um, in addition to you know, combating hate and racism and bigotry, you and I both share a passion for the University of Haifa. And so I just wanted to, to you know, speak a little bit about my personal experience there and ask you questions based on that. Um, I was part of the Weiss Not International Program in Holocaust Studies, and this is a program at the university that invites students from across the globe to discuss and learn how Holocaust history informs today's fight against anti-Semitism, against racism, against bigotry, propaganda, and scapegoating, a lot of the themes that we're discussing today. Um, but the program is unique because it's designed to include a diverse body of multi-ethnic students from all over the globe. So when I was a student there, I was perhaps one of four American students. Um, and the program was only about a third of Israeli students. So really working with students from Africa and Asia and, um, and Europe and getting their opinions on this, um, I think was such an incredible opportunity. Um, but in your opinion, why do you think it's important to examine both global anti-Semitism in addition to the specific ways that anti-Semitism developed in America or Europe and the Middle East within the context of Holocaust studies? I think um, Holocaust, uh, the experience of Holocaust will forever be one of the most powerful tools we have in educating next generations about the dangers um, of societies going from liberal to illiberal societies. I mean, really, that's what Germany was. And, and the atrocities that extremist ideology can um, bring upon uh, countries and, and, and their citizens. So there, the fact that today, more than ever, Holocaust studies have to be not only a major that you choose to opt into, but what part of my team's advocacy is really about Holocaust education around the world, making sure that governments are mandating Holocaust education in their public schools. Brazil today has a mandatory law that says Holocaust has to be taught as part of the public education system of Brazil. Europe has it. In America, it's more, you know, it's a mixed bag. So I am a very, very firm believer that we cannot um, let Holocaust just to be, you know, put aside as part of the, you know, history books. It is a live living lessons that we need today, um, especially as a political scientist. When I see what is happening in liberal democracies who are moving away from that and moving towards illiberalism like Turkey, um, and, and you see that the ideology that's being used in order to kind of cement this authoritarian grasp on their, on their people, like President Erdogan is doing in Turkey, is an ideology of exclusion, is an ideology of xenophobia, is an ideology of scapegoating religious minorities and turning them into enemies. It is the same, same tactics and two tools that were used by the Nazis. So the example of the Holocaust is not just for history books, it's for today and for the next generation to understand um, in order to be vigilant, as I said before, about what is happening in our own countries and here in the US as well. We cannot just sit back and, and think that we have a democracy and therefore we're safe. 
um, there are you know, trends in America today that are very worrisome to me as a political scientist that worry me and, and make me fearful. Um, of course, we have very strong democratic institutions. We hope that they will be you know, there to protect um, our democracy no matter what this political um, environment that we're in um, goes through and we have an election, hopefully everything will be fine. But I have to tell you that some of the trends that I see in, in other worrisome parts of the world, like in Eastern Europe, um, like in Hungary, the similar tactics are being replicated in other democracies as well. And those are very worrisome. And that's why the Holocaust and understanding it, knowing it intimately, knowing the signs and knowing the language and knowing the, the um, tools that were used um, are, are just very, very important. And, and my experience of Haifa, you know, in a way affected me in deep ways as well. Haifa University is probably the most diverse university um, in Israel. And I went there as a journalism student. I studied journalism undergrad. I went as a senior and I did a semester abroad there. And I really went there to understand the dynamic between Arab and Jewish uh, students at Haifa. And I lived in the dorms with them. And I really, beside what I was going on in the classrooms, it was very important for me to understand what was the interaction between Jewish and Arab students at Haifa. And it was a very important experience for me that has brought me to where I am today, really understanding what are the ingredients in um, society that are needed to make strong, robust um, societies that diversity can really um, um, blossom in it versus other um, trends that really create divisiveness and turn uh, minority majority groups into, into more of a uh, hostile relationship. So that experience of Haifa marked me and really um, has been a very important part of my academic um, and now work work um, path that has brought me to where I am today. Yeah, I completely agree that being able to attend a university where um, you have Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Druze students all learning together, all on campus together for the, um, I remember in the middle of the day on Wednesdays, there would be live music and beer served and all students coming together to not just learn, but to form a community, I think was such a strong piece of the university's, um, the, the vibe and the experience of being a student there. Like student life was so much more than just um, your typical college experience, but also hearing and learning from people from different communities and cultures and religions. It was an incredible cross-cultural experience for me as well. And I think it was very impactful. I'm sure it was impactful for you too. Uh, but when it turned out... I want yeah. to say one more time, I'm sorry, about uh, Holocaust education, and, and I forgot to say this. There are not only individuals who are extremists and who are, you know, we can write them off. There are governments today who partake in Holocaust denial, and that is my country of birth. The government of Iran holds conferences where they bring researchers, so-called researchers, where their whole um, goal is to to deny the fact that the Holocaust ever took place. So that trend, as we lose um, the last generation of Holocaust survivors, as we get further away historically from, from World War II, it is, very, you know, it, it is very important that we keep to the facts and we keep making sure that regimes like the Islamic Republic of Iran or others um, do not start creating an alternative narrative to what really happened during World War II, because that is the most dangerous um, step of all. And we know now with, in some ways, we talk about this post-fact society, which I, I don't wanna give into. We still believe in facts and we believe in, um, in, in uh, truths that we have to be as vigilant about it. And the program like Hi at Haifa is very important in making sure that even in Israel, in Israeli society, um, the understanding of the Holocaust is, is not forgotten and that is becomes a very current um, uh, issue of today. It is not just about understanding history. I agree. And I guess looking at Holocaust studies and understanding both the historical um, influences and impact, what do you think the appropriate balance to strike is between emphasizing the Holocaust but also calling out prejudice um, and other mass atrocities that we're seeing unfold today, uh, um, not just against Jews, but other minority groups. Absolutely. And then we at the ADL, you know, since our founding in 1913, 
Um, our mission was always to fight against defamation uh, of the Jewish people and to secure just and fair treatment for all. So we have historically spoken out um, for the plight of all vulnerable groups. And today, as part of our campaigns, um, we have spoken up not only for the Rohingya, we've talked now, we're looking at the Uyghurs and really what's the situation in China. We as the Jewish people have a responsibility and ADL holds that responsibility very in a very serious way to call out any other atrocity that, that either replicates or is in line with what happened um, during World War II and the Holocaust. So we have to speak up. We have a responsibility to do that. Um, and uh, it really is on all of us and within those Holocaust studies programs to take the example of the Holocaust, but to also show that never again, unfortunately, did not, has not been the case. And there have been many, many um, genocides that have taken place since the Holocaust. And we have to study those as well. And we have to speak up on behalf of those minorities and those vulnerable groups who are targeted as well. I wanna shift a little bit to give questions from the audience. I don't know if that's okay with you, Sharon. Um, and there's a question here about what degree is the existence of Israel a game changer in understanding the danger of anti-Semitism today? Are we perhaps fighting, um, you know, how, and really I know that you have a background um, in understanding international governments and international relations and his, how historically anti-Semitism has unfolded, but how do you think the founding of Israel has impacted that? Well, obviously, uh, hugely, hugely impactful. The, with the creation of a state for the Jewish people, um, we now uh, have not only had uh, thousands of years of yearning that have been, uh, that, that was achieved, but also, um, again, as someone who had to run away from from my country of birth, also a safe haven that I knew, my family knew that if we had to leave Iran, we, we went to Israel. And um, so in terms of safety and security, the fact that all Jews in the world know that if they are no longer safe in their country of birth, that there is a place for them that will take them in, no questions asked, that is a huge factor. But as far as the international community, that also is a game changer. Um, we are no longer um, just relying on governments of our countries of birth in Europe, in, in Middle East, in Latin America to, seek, to keep us safe. Um, it is the responsibility of all of us as a shared community globally to make sure that the Jews and other minorities um, are protected. And the fact that we have a very strong voice now in Israel, in the Israeli government, in what it represents, also help secure um, Jews um, in wherever danger faces them in their own countries. So um, the establishment of the state of Israel is a game, was a game changer, continues to be. And it's, a, it's, it's for us, not only a matter of psychological and emotional safety, but physical safety, all of us. And, and, and also it's, you know, it's a country that has its own complications and, and, and its own complexities for the Jewish people around the world. And, and we have to make sure that we keep Israel strong and democratic. So its own identity as a Jewish and democratic state also has to be not taken for granted and how it evolves as a state for its own citizens and, and all its citizens, including its um, uh, a non-Jewish citizen. I think it's, we, it's very important for, for Israel to continue to be a robust democracy and a Jewish state for its Jewish citizens and its non-Jewish citizens. Yeah, and um, there's another question here, and actually a few people have brought up your thoughts on the BLM movement and its ambiguous stance on Israel, but we, were, we have a question from the audience wondering what your thoughts specifically on that are. So uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, this, this for me again, um, remember that I'm an immigrant, so an, an immigrant from the Middle East, personally speaking, this is really a, an important eye-opening moment. We've had conversations with my children. So I have American-born children who are in their 20s now. And around our dinner table, we've talked about, not only about um, institutional racism in America, not only about um, police brutality, but about identity and race. And how do we see ourselves as Middle Eastern uh, Jews? And are we people of color or are we not? So the Black Lives Matter movement um, has, professionally speaking now, is a, a movement that ADL stands behind. Now, there are complexities and com complications. Um, the 
uh, Movement for Black Lives, which was uh, one entity under this broad movement. And we, co we compare the Black Lives movement as, as a very diverse, um, multifaceted movement of people, um, uh, just like the Soviet U movement for Soviet Jewry. You know, you, you have a big umbrella, you have lots of organizations under it, advocating for very similar, uh, very similar um, issues and, and causes. Um, there was on the platform of the Movement for Black Lives um, language that was very incendiary of Israel and uh, really hateful language that continues to be there today. What we at ADL feel is that the movement itself is one that we um, absolutely align with and we see eye to eye. Um, but we will continue to look for and call out any instances of anti-Semitism that, um, that becomes uh, public and that we become aware of. So whether it's chapter of Black Lives Matter, um, I think most of you would, uh, noticed that uh, last week was this day of rage, which was um, more of a Palestinian led um, uh, campaign of uh, one day where uh, it was an anti-annexation um, campaign against Israel, uh, possibly annexing the West Bank. But with it came in some cities, there were some um, language and there were some signs connecting it with the Black Lives Matter movement. So these kind of interweaving of some of these issues becomes a little bit thorny and a little bit complex. But we will call out anti-Semitism at ADLs we have um, at any instance where we see it. But as a movement today, ADL as a civil rights organization with a long history of battling for civil rights, um, we stand um, shoulder to shoulder with the civil rights leaders of this country who, and, and all the people out demonstrating who really believe this is a moment of reckoning and we have to look at police brutality and we have to look at the uh, racism that exists in uh, the institutions in this country. So we, we have to really be careful about um, you know, what, what's, what, what is the narrative that's being used and when that narrative crosses the line and is hijacked, into anti-Semitic or anti-Israel uh, narrative, then we will call it out, no questions asked. So that's where we are right now in this moment about, about the movement. I just thank you so much for that very thoughtful and honest answer. Um, and pulling a little bit on that anti-Israel move, uh, calling out anti-Israel sentiment, what do you think is being done about anti-Israel bias and misinformation in school materials being taught in secondary schools and universities, um, either in this country or abroad, I know that there is ex extreme anti-Semitism and anti-Israel being taught in schools throughout the Middle East and um, the globe, but specifically in the US. I mean, what, what do you think is being done or should be done to combat the anti-Israel bias? Um, I think university campuses in America are probably uh, one of the most challenging spaces now uh, for us when it comes to anti-Israel rhetoric. Um, the combination of kind of progressive social justice agendas, which many Jewish students identify with, um, has somehow taken this pivot towards this idea that um, being pro-Israel or being a Zionist um, is, is a, a somehow you have to check your Zionism at the door when you come in. And there's been many reported cases of students, Jewish students on different American campuses who have experienced um, being um, kept out of social justice movements because of their pro-Zionist or pro-Israel stance. So the idea of how do we turn, especially in progressive spaces, a love for Israel or, or advocacy for Israel uh, into something that students can be proud of and feel safe with is a challenge. Um, we do that by really coming into the uh, so social justice space from a place of talking about civil rights, um, really strong coalition building and making sure that those coalitions um, really stand and also um, speaking and educating more and more about Israel as a vibrant democracy that has um, that has flaws, that has criticisms, like we uh, criticize policy of any country. We as Americans criticize American policy and uh, criticism of Israeli policy should be allowed and should be part of a vibrant conversation on any campus or anywhere. But when you cross the line from 
criticism of Israeli policy, to questioning the very right of Israel to exist, to question the right of whether Jews have a right to a homeland, these are really stepping into more anti-Semitism spaces that have to be called out. So the, those are, you know, it's, it's a bit of nuance sometimes. It gets tricky sometimes. And I know people don't like nuance at this moment in our, in our, in our world history, but it is imperative that we don't um, really uh, have uh, overreactions to things, but also to make sure that there's space enough for open dialogue and for criticisms where it is when he's talking about policy and not calling everything anti-Semitism, but when the line is crossed and when BDS becomes the narrative. And we know that BDS, for example, the, the, the founders of BDS, not everyone who follows BDS, students on campus may, you know, may want to use it as a, um, a nonviolent form of voicing their um, op opposition to Israeli policy. But we know that the formation of BDS was not based on reaching a two-state solution, was not really achieved, you know, based on achieving peace, but it was about kind of really getting rid of Israel as a state. Um, that's when we have to call it out. So we at ADL kind of, in a way, are, are, um, we, we call it strikes and balls when we see it. We try to be very thoughtful and systematic about when those lines are crossed, um, but also make sure that um, real discussion um, and, and questioning is still allowed and that students at universities uh, or any space um, are able to participate in, in criticism of Israeli policy. Um, and that should be the case. But the, when the line is drawn and, and is crossed, then we need to call it out clearly. And kind of diving a little bit more into these nuanced issues that, that we see happening and understanding the difference, differences, how would you distinguish the difference between fringe Jewish hatred but versus institutionalized anti-Jewish activity? And what do you think we can confront both or either? Um, is there an, more of an importance or a pressing to kind of tackle fringe Jewish hatred or do you think they both need to be combated head on? I, what, is your, what are your thoughts? I think the danger lies is when the fringe becomes mainstreamed. And that's where we have to be very worried. I mean, we have all seen that throughout history, anti-Semitism, and sadly, unfortunately, has been with us. But when you see this uptick in the rhetoric <clears throat> and the narrative and the symbology of <clears throat> extreme um, anti-Semitism from the extremes of white supremacy, of you know, that language coming into the mainstream, as we are seeing in America today, and we're seeing it around the world, that's when we have to be very, very, very concerned and vigilant to fight against. So when world leaders, um, where heads of state are using narratives or language um, that is mimicking that of very fringe extreme um, white supremacist groups or fringe extreme um, left-wing groups like Jeremy Corbyn has done, you know, when he was the head of the Labour Party in the UK, those instances have to be called out. And we cannot just let uh, leaders in our societies today um, normalize and streamline that kind of uh, language and ideology that goes behind it. And that's really where the danger is. Uh, those extremist groups and ideologies, you know, they, they have to be in the dark fringes of society. And maybe they'll always be there, but we cannot allow them to come into mainstream and come into this kind of a normalized part of um, society where they feel comfortable and they feel emboldened to say whatever they want. So that's really where the danger is and we have to really fight up against that uh, vigorously. You st we've spoken a lot about corporations and institutions and organizations, um, but how do we combat or how do we even speak to our friends or family or children when we see famous celebrities making anti-Semitic remarks? Um, how is that a little bit different from something coming from an organization or an institution? And, and what can we do to start to educate those around us on the dangers of that? So um, I think that's very important for each of us to see what we can do on an individual basis. Um, you've seen now over the, over the weekend, all this um, celebrity um, kind of endorsement of someone like Louis Farrakhan, who, I mean, is just an unabashed, you know, hateful anti-Semite and the language that he uses, I can't even imagine. I mean, we just um, also posted about Madonna. He, she had, um, um, I don't know if she was unwittingly and didn't know about it, but 
lifting up Louis Farrakhan's speech uh, for the 4th of July speech that he gave. Uh, that is just full of it, full of hateful language um, and you know virulent um, anti-Semitism. Um, as far as the, on the individual level, we have to make sure that in whatever um, spaces we find ourselves, when um, even in a joking matter, um, issues of um, otherism, um, when anti-Semitic language is used, even in a joking matter, it has to be called out. So we have to be brave enough in those moments. Um, to say something. So if you see something, say something. It's very important. Um, I think it's important to um, give our children, and especially young adults, the courage and the confidence to know um, that they don't have to do that if, if they really don't feel comfortable, but that if they, are, they do feel strong enough that they can say something. Because when, when we uh, avoid those uncomfortable situations and we feel that um, you know, just let it go. It's just that, you know, someone who's ignorant, let it go. In fact, that, that leads to more harm. Um, also, in terms of what's going on in our society today, we all have our own social media voices today. So we can be vigilant. Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of divisiveness that goes on on Facebook and in a lot of places, and we all get into our own bubbles where we're not talking with those who we don't necessarily agree with. Um, I think we need to open up our bottle bubbles a little bit. Um, we need to start speaking with those who we don't see eye to eye politically. Um, but in fact, you have shared values and you know that extremism of any, of any side is really not good for, uh, not healthy for society. So we have to come out of our echo chambers a little bit and try to really uh, go back to the way we interacted with one another before there was social media where you would come across people of all sorts. Um, if you're sitting at a cafe or if you're going to a dinner party, you meet new people, you don't know where their politics is and you come and try to find some shared understanding and shared values. Um, the echo chambers and the bubbles are really not healthy for us and we are constantly get pulled in again by the algorithms and by the likes and, and the information we seek into only coming across very like-minded people and then getting more extreme in those ideas. So if you're kind of a more center-right political person, you'll only hear from people who are center right or right or even further right and you kind of evolve and, and maybe take you in a direction you're not comfortable with. So interacting with people who don't all agree with you, um, having that respect uh, and sense of that we all have, have good intentions, there's no one right formula for anything and there's no one political candidate that's perfect. Um, making sure that we continue to expose ourselves to that those kind of ideas and ideas that we might not love but we need to hear and continue to engage with one thing that or you've said many things that resonate with me but i think something so powerful is when you say be brave and leave your echo chamber and leave your bubble and don't be afraid to speak up or disagree with other people because you're you're so right that when we get into these spaces where we just continuously agree with everyone we're not allowing ourselves to learn from others and to even teach others and so I, I think that's such a powerful message that you're sharing and i hope that our audience i'm sure our audience is agreeing with that um, i think we have time for about one or two more questions uh, i just kind of wanted to wrap up and see or discuss the fact that you know this conversation feels so overwhelming anti-semitism seems to be coming from so many different places do you think there's a one size fits all solution for combating? Should we be addressing the unique attributes of each source? Um, what, what would you say to that? No, this has to be a multi-pronged um, approach and a, and a real battle. I don't, I'm not a, someone who uses military terms a lot, but I do feel like there's, it's a bit of a war going on and, and we have to come at it from every possible direction whether it's education, whether it's advocacy, whether it's looking at our legislators and, and making sure we have laws that protect us, working with law enforcement, making sure that they're keeping us safe, but they're also understanding what it is to be minority uh, in a minority neighborhood and what it is to feel safe. Um, all of those things, it takes it all of it and it takes technological tools and it takes, you know, we cannot afford to only choose one of those tools. We have to use every tool at our disposal and also to feel empowered by them. Um, I'm not one who believes in, you know, working on the basis of fear. We have to feel empowered. We have to feel that we all can come together and we see the threat, we see the dangers and we have tools that we can respond to them with. So 
Um, we hope that ADL is one of those and we continue to do the work we do and, and Haifa University for sure is one of them as well. So just to kind of end, I know we, we talked about a lot of scary and horrific trends, but what is your outlook for the future? Is it optimistic? Um, what is something that you wanna leave us with thinking, whether it's hopeful or brave, uh, what would you say to our listeners and our watchers? Probably my current favorite word is resilience. I think I really am a firm believer, both as a mother of three children, but also as a manager at ADL of my team, and also as a citizen of Los Angeles and, and the US, and, 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 and also I'm a citizen of Israel. I do believe that these uh, challenges that we're all facing will make our societies a more resilient society. So um, I, I am hopeful in that through the strength, through being stress tested in the way we are, these are challenging times. We don't want to minimize that. Um, there are real threats that we're facing, but the resilience that we will bring to uh, um, all the issues we look forward going to going forward will enable us to tackle whatever challenges we have ahead. So I think uh, this is a very important moment for us to feel stronger and to have even more tools to respond to whatever we face going forward. Wow, Sharon, this has been such an informative hour. I can't believe everything you've shared and your experiences. It sounds like you've lived 15 lives. Um, there's so much that you've taught me and I'm sure everyone who's been tuning in. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you, your... Jordana. And thank you for Hyper University for doing this. Really appreciate it. This, this was tremendous to echo Jordana and I'm sure everybody who is still with us. Uh, their thoughts. Thank you so much for leading such an important discussion and, and sharing your time and expertise. And, and we certainly benefit from your unique perspectives from both of you. Um, I think that these, these insights illuminate such a significant time for Jewish people across the globe. And it really encourages us to think more deeply about the importance of education and activation uh, and, and standing up and overcoming anti-Semitism. So thank you so much. Um, if, if anyone has questions about today's conversation or anything related to University of Haifa, please feel free to contact us at info at asuh.org. If you would like to support the university's Weiss Live Not, if, uh, Live Not International Program in Holocaust Studies or any of the other faculties or programs uh, that University of Haifa uh, offers, please visit uh, www.asuh.org backslash donate. Um, thank you for joining us today. Everyone stay well and we'll look forward to seeing you soon.